So before I start to talk about what I'm doing, uh, I'm going to introduce you with the general coding workflow that we decided to use for Recipe, as well as the whole software's work workflow and a few explanation of what actually GUI does. So this a graphical user interface does. And then uh, we're going to see some data processing, including importing data, what formats Recipe uh, accepts, how you can filter and clean your data, as well as some error modeling capabilities that Recipe uh, is capable of doing. And then I'm going to discuss the, the one of the most powerful elements of the software, which is definition of the final element mesh and forward modeling. Uh, inversion is something that many of people have done, but for modeling usually requires uh, a, a bit of, uh, you know, you have to create your model and creation of the model usually requires a lot of uh, complex input files. But with recipe in both 2D and 3D uh, spaces, you're capable of doing this with a few clicks of your mouse. So we decided to use Python 3 language for coding of this software because Python is very powerful and is very uh, globalized and everybody kind of knows what Python is uh, is capable of. And, and whenever we had a problem, we didn't understand something or we wanted to do something with, with a simple Google search, you could have just find something similar and uh, basically improve your coding. That's why we chose uh, Python. And Python is an open source uh, coding environment and uh, that doesn't require purchasing a license like MATLAB or anything like that. And that's why we chose this programming language. Our code is an object oriented workflow, meaning that we are using something called classes. And this provides you with the opportunity to define an object that includes all of the capability of recipe in one programming object. That means you don't have to, if you're if you're an environment that you can code rather than just using the graphical user interface, you don't really need to uh, open and close your programming interface to do different data analysis with one programming interface. That's what the object-oriented uh, workflow will bring the programmers. Additionally, with choosing this path, we were able to separate the programming interface from the graphical user interface. This means that the actual engine behind this GUI that we are seeing is completely separate from the GUI itself. It's, provide, it, it's going to provide all the people who can code with the ability to change the main engine, but not to interfere with the GUI and they can add their own features if they like. We can change it while the GUI is working fine. This provides the additional opportunity for people who want to learn programming in, ge in the geophysical uh, community. You can use the API without the GUI and still uh, learn about coding and doing your data analysis in the complex environment of uh, programming language rather than just using the graphical user interface. The general workflow that Recipe follows is a very uh, straightforward. Recipe is capable of doing an inverse problem, solving an inverse problem, and also do a forward modeling. So what is an inverse problem? Basically, in your inverse problem, you have some data that you have collected from subsurface with a uh, general electrical resistivity or induced polarization array from the surface and you want to create a subsurface model. For that, you will need to import your data. You need to filter the bad data, data points. And if you have uh, some other type of measurements, you can additionally do error analysis uh, with recipe. And after that, you have to define a finite element mesh, meaning you have to discretize your subsurface into tiny bits and try to change each tiny bits to receive a whole picture of the subsurface. These are all conducted through this inverse problem that is happening inside recipes engines called R2 or CR2 or R3T and CR3T. 
The other way is when you have a hypothesis, when you have, you know that, okay, I have a subsurface that will look like this. For example, there is a tank that is buried in subsurface, but I want to see if I take out a, an array and an instrument, what will the data look like? For that, you will need to do a forward problem. Basically, you turn your hypothesis into actual data points. So basically you are supposed to build an array and then on that finite element mesh, instead of changing them to get the model, now you assign values to that finite element mesh and then you can add some errors to it to make sure it's more realistic, like some percentage of noise and then get the data. So this is forward model. Both of them in 2D and 3D are possible with recipe. The good thing is that you do not need any special input format files, although recipe already accepts a lot of different input format files. But if you don't have that, you you are okay. You all you need is just different columns of data and just import them in recipe and do your data analysis. Additionally, you definitely don't need any external processing. You don't need to clean up your data before <clears throat> importing them into recipe. This makes recipe a very simple yet intuitive software that has everything in all, all in one package, plotting, data analysis, filtering, and even post-processing that we are going to discuss in a non-linear workflow, which is meaning that you don't really need to step by step do something to get your data or model. You only need to follow a few of them. Or if you want to do a very thorough data analysis, you can follow all the steps available. But to put it in perspective, all you need to, for inversion, for example, you need to import your data and click on the inversion. And all the way you get your inversion with default parameters. That usually turns out the good results. But sometimes if the subsurface structure is more complex, you need to uh, tweak some, some parameters. For example, in here, you're seeing that there is a, sorry, show, there we go. For example, in here, you're seeing that we have a 3D uh, pseudo section that when we can assign a uh, final LMS mesh to it and then simply invert it. And by assigning different values to uh, for ISO surfaces, we can just simply say, okay, maybe this orange one is uh, contamination in subsurface and so on. So importing the data, you are, uh, capable of importing with file formats of famous softwares like rest 2 inv and rest 3 inv as well as some not really known codes, but very powerful ones like uh, PyGimli's BERT format or E4D format. These are the specific uh, file formats that you can import. And if your uh, topography information are already included in your uh, importing file, such as this one, you will get a, a beautiful pseudo section of the uh, measurements. If you have IP data, also you can check in the authorization or if recipe already understands this, that there are IP data available in if you're choosing one of these standard file formats, also uh, that will be checked automatically. <clears throat> and then right away you can invert your data. Now, some of you might say, okay, we don't have any standard data formats, so what are we supposed to do? Do we have to change the input file? No, of course not. All you need to do is just import them and select the columns related to your electrodes and resistivity or resistance values and import them in recipe. And then you can go into the topography tab and simply uh, add your electrode locations, X, Y, Z values. And if they are buried in subsurface, you also can check that and then import everything and start your data analysis. And it's also important to note that sometimes you don't have the actual topography values for every electrode you have. And for that, all you need is just a few data points and then the rest can be interpolated linearly if they are missing, like this one, for example, if we interpolate that linearly and you are good to go. Additionally, sometimes you have a surface uh, that is more complex than just a few uh, electrodes that you laid down on it. 
and maybe the electrodes are pretty sparse, in that case, uh, for that specific topography, you can add additional topography points, meaning that if your electrodes are around a uh, around a mountain, but you need to see the inside the mountain, how it looks, and or the, the topography structure of the mountain should be included. So you can actually add that as well. If your data includes some reciprocal measurements, meaning that your data uh, has the electrode, current electrodes as position at position one and two, and the potentials at position three and four, and then you just swap them, then now potentials become at the uh, locations one and two, and currents go at three and four. Then in theory, the measurements are supposed to be from one point in subsurface, and they should be exactly the same. But in practice and reality, this is not the case. There is human error, instrument error, even uh, electro location errors and so on. So that may not be the case. If that the specific measurement doesn't look good, you have to either clean it up from your data or you must uh, assign a weight to it to make sure that it does not affect your overall data analysis and inversion uh, significantly. For that, you can use the ca uh, filtering capabilities in Recipe. Uh, the simplest of the filtering is basically clicking on, for example, a bad electrode and remove it, or clicking on individual points on the map and remove it. And also, you can remove whatever percentage of the reciprocal error you like from your data set. Additionally, some instrument provide uh, uh, dummy measurements, one of them is uh, Syscal, Iris Syscal, Iris Instrument Syscal, so you can also remove that as well. If your data includes phase values or IP measurements, since IP data is far less, uh, uh, the signal to noise ratio is smaller than the actual resistivity, you need more filtering capabilities. Resistivity provides you with a lot of uh, filtering capability, including range filtering, meaning that if you think you're working in a near surface environment, and for that, uh, you may not ex uh, expect to see high values of phase or chargeability, you can filter them out. If your data include individual decay curves for the chargeability measurements, you can also use something we call a DCA or decay curve analysis filtering, which basically creates a master decay curve. And based on that master decay curve, we'll compare all the individual decay curves. And if certain of those measurements are outside of a certain standard deviation, those data points will be filtered out. Additionally, it has been shown that the chargeability and phase shift at low frequency measurements are, uh, have a linear relationship, and therefore you can interchangeably use them in your data analysis. Uh, we provide you with a conversion capability that you can simply change chargeability values to phase shift based on the instrument that you use. It is uh, important to note that all the filterings, you can reset them and go back if you don't like it. If too many data points have been filtered out, you can just reset everything and start filtering from the beginning. Now, if your data includes the reciprocal measurements, you have the possibility of doing some error modeling. The benefit of error modeling is that you assign some weight to the points that you're measuring, and this weight will act as uh, a restriction for the, for the effect of that a specific point in your overall inversion, meaning that if the the, the reciprocal and the normal did not match perfectly and simply they are not a good sort of a measurement, you can assign a low weight to them and that ensures that they are not affecting your inversion too much. And if certain data points have a good quality, meaning that their normal and reciprocal pair are pretty similar, you can assign a, assign a higher weight to them and make sure that actually affect your inversion better than the bad quality data. You can do the error modeling for both resistance and phase, if available phase. Uh, and you're provided with linear and parallel for resistance and parallel and parabola for, for the uh, phase shift values. But it's important to note that uh, 
you're not just bound to this linear or parallel. You can you can add your own method to the API if you like. If you know Python programming, it's very easy to just uh, simply uh, follow these uh, steps and create your own function. And then you will have different, uh, for example, I don't know, second uh, degree polynomial or something like that to your resistance if you like. And the last step prior to inversion is creating your final element mesh. In 2D and 3D space, this is provided for a simple surface and borehole measurements, across borehole measurements. For example, for in this specific uh, mesh that you're seeing in here, it is a surface study. If your, uh, your model is more complex than this and includes a different type of, uh, if it's a closed boundary, for example, or if it's uh, something that not uh, as simple as a surface measurement, you can simply uh, import your mesh, your custom mesh, and use that. And you're not bound to just whatever recipe provides to you. Additionally, you can control the depth that you want to investigate yourself. You can control how these elements are getting enlarged with depth and uh, and so on. And you also can uh, assign some known uh, anomalies or values to your mesh as well. For example, if you have a river and you know that river does not need inversion because this, its resistivity is already known, so you simply assign, uh, create the river and simply assign a value to it and fix that region and make sure that it is not affecting your inversion. Now, I want to show you how recipe works in action. So for that, uh, I will show you two uh, simple uh, modeling for 2D and 3D4 modeling. And if time allows, I'm going to show you a cross borehole inversion. For that, if you're using a computer, you can simply download it now from our uh, GitLab repository or scan this code and it directs you to the download page. And then we can just uh, we can both uh, work with it at the at the same time. But if not, uh, let, let me just start with uh, using recipe. I find, where was it? Sorry. Okay. So if you're a developer, you can also download the source code like, like what we have in here and run it through the source code. But if you're not, uh, compiled packages that single executable files are also provided that you can simply use those. Um, I hope the quality is good enough that you can see something, but let me know if it's not. All right, so for 2D, uh, just to confirm, you're seeing the software right now, right? Okay, good. Great. All right. So for 2D4 modeling, you're selecting 2D and then checking forward. By default, it's always on inversion. And then if you have uh, in, in your hypothesis, if you have induced precision data, you're going to check that as well. This uh, example is going to be very simple. So I'm going to go with like 24 electrode, one meter spacing, and just generate an array. Okay. So you have the electrode labels and also their position on the ground. You also can give it topography if you have. And then there are a few options like making a quadrilateral mesh. I don't really like it. A lot of people don't like quadrilateral mesh, but how? Uh, but we are providing the opportunity. The thing is with quadrilateral meshes, uh, usually you can't have complex topography because uh, these are blocks and then your topography will look like a block kind of situation. So for that, it's better to always use the triangular mesh. Triangular meshes much easier to work with and usually runs faster because the cell sizes increase with depth better than the quadrilateral mesh. You also can design your model prior to meshing and only available for triangular mesh, which I'm going to do right now. The benefit of this is that, for example, you know the subsurface structure's uh, shape. For example, if you have a tank, right, uh, the, it usually is rectangular, right? So I'm going to add a rectangle and then I'm going to create my mesh and my anomaly looks exactly as a rectangle. The other uh, thing is that you have to assign a value to it. 
I'm going to make a conductive feature, which is about uh, 20 ohmmeters and also some uh, degree of polarizability to it, like 20 on the radian. Okay. And then you go to the forward tab, forward model tab. In a form model, you are provided with the standard array formats like dipole, dipole, winner, and so on. Additionally, if uh, for some people who don't know how they might look like on the ground, uh, we provide a simple graph that shows, okay, what this A or N means. For dipole, dipole, this factor A basically is a factor multiplied by your electrode spacing, and N is the number of skips, meaning that when these uh, M and M are going to go, with one skip and then two skip and so on, and eventually eight skips. And then when this one is reached, uh, we move A and B one uh, ahead. You also can add noise to your data to make it more realistic. So I'm gonna add like 3% noise to resistivity and also one mil radian noise for my face. And then you can simply run forward mod. <clears throat> As you can see on the pseudo sections, you're clearly seeing this conductive feature that is also polarizable. You can counter this if you like to see it better. And if your screen is small, you also can just drag this up. So these, these are plotting features available. If you're doing inversion, uh, right away after the forward modeling, uh, you don't need to change any of these guys uh, that are inversion settings. But in case you're doing an inversion, uh, you are provided with detailed explanation of what parameter actually can be changed uh, in in the actual engine of the inversion with a detailed help. And uh, sometimes you need to move, uh, change these guys to get a better result. For that, it's always good to click on them and understand which one means what. And then I'm going to run this inversion. Uh, depending on the computer, it usually uh, runs fast, but sometimes can run slow. Okay, that was pretty fast. I just wanted to explain that you also get the uh, the reduction in RMS ver versus the iterations. It is always good to know that when you're doing any inversions that the value of RMS should be reducing with iterations. If it's not that the case, you have to go back and usually change some inversion settings or add an error model if you can, or change some of these uh, uh, default error values that we have in here, and then go back and usually that helps a lot. All right, when we go to the results tab, you will be able to see, for example, right now you have a forward model. You can see your initial model, and you can also see its inversion results you can see different parameters that the inversion outputs for example uh, magnitude no meter and as you can see we assign 20 ohmmeters and it's clearly this area in here and phase for example again minus 20 this is the region with the highest phase value and so on there, there are a lot of features you can use conductivity and uh, so many things but sometimes the, the value you're looking for is not in here for that, you can go to compute attribute and simply from this parameters in here, calculate the attribute you're looking for. For example, you may want to calculate the uh, moisture content. And we know that we can change uh, with some information from the subsurface, we can calculate that based on resistivity. So you simply can use the resistivity in here and calculate moisture content and get the moisture, moisture content plot in here. You also have the ability to use the depth of investigation. DOI in here stands for depth of investigation. Recipe has two approaches for that. One is just an estimate based on the sensitivity of your array and measurements. As you can see, since this part is more conductive, uh, the, the depth of uh, investigation is shallower. You also have the actual, uh, uh, a better approach, which is we're calling it model DOI is based on uh, a well-known method introduced by Oldenburg and Lee in 1999. Uh, basically, we invert uh, your data uh, three times with twice of those times being uh, restricted to the background uh, uh, from the background inversion and one just as regular. And based on comparison between these two, we will uh, get a more, more accurate depth of investigation. If you really want to know about that, I can, I can uh, give you this reference for more information. 
And at the end, you will have the ability of doing post-processing. Post-processing is basically just checking how the inversion errors are looking. And sometimes you may have a, a bad inversion, meaning that the normalized error, which is supposed to be between negative 3 to 3%, it's not. And uh, it's far more than that. And for that, you can uh, either go back and change some inversion settings and redo it. But sometimes there are some few data points that you can't just clean up like that. So for that, you can simply uh, either remove them from the pseudo section like that, or you can just uh, select uh, keep whatever is between negative three and three or whatever that's more acceptable for you and just uh, clean up those uh, bad inver inverted results. But for this specific inversion, everything went just fine. And uh, always uh, refer to the help of the software. We have a very uh, simple general help in here that gives you an idea of uh, what each tab does and how you can export your data and use them in third-party apps such as Paraview for better uh, uh, visualization or where your data in XYZ format are stored and so on. Additionally, we provide a detailed documentation of what each of these uh, functions do. And additional to that, we have video tutorials on YouTube that you can just simply uh, watch for more complex examples than what I'm trying to show you today. If you're more into inversion, definitely read the readme files of the inversion and modeling engines in, used in recipe R2, CR2, and so on. Uh, that will give you a very good idea of what's going on in recipe. Now let's do a uh, 3D forward modeling. For that, I'm just going to restart everything and then select 3D and forward. Similar to 2D, you have to define your electrode array. I'm going to use 12 electrodes. Now in 3D, it is per number of lines you have. So it's going to be 12 electrodes per line. I'm going to have uh, four lines and three meters of spacing and two meters of spacing between electrodes and generate. As you can see, the X locations are the, uh, apart with two meters of spacing and then Y locations of electrodes is three meters. And again, if I go to mesh tab, now you don't have the capability of doing quadrilateral or triangular anymore, but you have the tetrahedron mesh. It's the 3D form of like triangular mesh. And you can create your mesh. Now on this one, you have to select uh, your anomaly. You don't have the capability of uh, designing your model anymore because it's pretty hard to, uh, to code something that works on, on uh, undefined space, let's say. So for now, uh, the only possibility is just to select uh, the points that your anomaly would be uh, ideally. You also have the capability of uh, changing the element size and everything. Uh, if you hover your mo mouse over uh, any of the parameters in any part of uh, recipe, you will get a short help which uh, that what that specific uh, uh, tool does. For example, uh, characteristic length. That means that is the length of each element. For default, is two elements per elect two electrodes, or uh, one node per two electrodes, and so on. Okay, for forward modeling in 3D, you have to first uh, define your anomaly region, which simply uh, okay. I have some issue again. <laughs> All right. I just realized the bug. Okay, I'm gonna do it like that. Okay. All right, so you have to de uh, define your selection box. All right, so the selection box will be like that and you can uh, move it to, well, for some reason it's not working as I expected, unfortunately. Oh, there you go, okay. Uh, it's, it's again, it's in 3D space. It's not so easy to select these parts and uh, sometimes it's hard to get the handles perfectly. Anyway, so this box will act as a selection for the elements on the mesh. So now you have to add the region and it automatically will select uh, all the point, all the uh, elements available in the mesh that are inside the box. 
and sometimes it's not perfect because you also selected something a bit outside and that's going to get selected so forgive us this is just some rudimentary uh, modeling approach but anyway we can give it a 20 ohm meter again more conductive you're also available uh, again you can use any of these a standard one but sometimes uh as you're using a, oh, I forgot something very important. You have to use exit mode because if you don't use that, then you're not having any selection. All right, so there's two zones here, this one, two regions actually, and uh, the background region and the conductive region, right? Now uh, we define four lines and there were these, right? But in 3D format, you can have any number of, uh, uh, com any combination you like, any four electrode combination you like. For that, it's always a uh, good practice to use the custom sequence importation. You basically define your electrode locations on the grid and import them in a in a four column uh, format data format. But if you you don't want to do that, you can simply use any of these dipole dipole winner or something, and recipe automatically uh, figures out the lines. As you can see here, it kind of figured, okay, this is one line, this is two and three and four, but your actual grid might be just exactly opposite. So for that, you have to use the custom sequence. Anyway, so you have this uh, 3D uh, sort of uh, pseudo section, and you can see the conductive part in here and the background. And similar to the 2D inversion, you can simply go and invert this. And as you can see, uh, you can, uh, either look at it as like a block like this, or you also can have the grid, or you can uh, do much more with it. You can slice this, okay? I'm gonna slice it at y equal to eight, and also a few slices at different x locations, maybe one at uh, one at like uh, 15, and then one at 10, and one at five, and also z at, uh, uh, minus four, minus four, okay. And then you have this as slices. You can slice through it and see the inside of the inverted block. Additionally, you can uh, change the uh, the color map and look at it. And you also have the capability of uh, uh, selecting what part to be shown, all right? So for example, I don't want anything to be shown above 30 ohm meters. And I can select uh, select that. Oh, sorry, this is in. Okay, I have to figure this. There we go. Thirty. Apply. Okay. So now anything above thirty is excluded from the plot. Also, you can use the isosurface. Similar to that, if I choose thirty and apply that, it will only show the surface of the feature that had thirty ohm meter and nothing inside of it. You can separate these values by comma. And if I select like um, 90 in here, 30 and 90 and apply that, you also see the 90 in here. And also post-processing again, always look at this. If your inversion went not good, go, go back and change different parameters. All right, let's go back. All right. Okay, so I prepared a few videos that uh, no longer required because I showed you the software. And uh, because of the time, I'm not showing the cross borehole either. It, it's very simple. Uh, the examples are available and uh, on, uh, on our repository as well as the YouTube channel. But let's see actually what recipe is capable of doing. Let's look at some case studies. So. Uh, with electrical resistivity, we can kind of uh, identify different type of uh, plants, genotypes of plants, because of the way they uptake moisture or water from the surface to as, as the source of their uh, nutrition um, pathways. And here, uh, uh, Wally et al. in 2017 uh, went to a field that was planted with wheat, and they started to do some ERT monitoring over time in three different months. And based on the differences that root water uptake, uh, uptake showed on the ERT results, they, they figured out what's, uh, what 
it's going to happen if different type of uh, weeds were planted in that area. For that, they uh, conducted a time-lapse ERT survey. Basically, a time-lapse ERT survey is when you measure the background, meaning uh, the, the actual survey area, and then in future times you come, do the measurement, but now just invert the data based on the changes you're seeing. That's why, for example, March is in here, shows no percent changes that much around zero because the, the it's very close to the background, which was in, uh, uh, in April. But as you go, you can see more resistive features are uh, ap appearing at the surface, indicating that the wheat plants actually uptook the water and that's why the surfaces get drier and drier. So this is one thing that you can do with recipe, simply go collect, uh, collect, uh, collect your data and come back and feed recipe with your data and do a time-lapse inversion and see how it looks. No longer required to do any different type of coding or making different meshes or anything, everything is done automatically. Another case study is uh, this, uh, is done in a riverbed to understand the, the interactions between the groundwater and surface water. It's very important to know these interactions and also to know the subsurface structure underneath a river. For example, if a contamination is in the river and how it's going to get into the groundwater, which is a source of drinking water for most of us or agricultural activities, it's very good to know if there is a pathway for that contamination to get into the groundwater. That's why it's always good to know these structures under a river. <clears throat> for that, uh, a few uh, people uh, led by uh, Paul went and uh, laid down their electrodes underneath a shallow river and uh, conducted a few uh, ERT measurements. But now they had to include the river in their inversion because they knew its resistivity and they don't didn't want the inversion to include that. Recipe provided them with the opportunity to create a complex topography, include the river, and bury the electrodes in under the river and fix the river and do an inversion. And with that, they realized there is a resistive gravel part underneath the river with a, a much more conductive peat structure at the river bank. Another uh, case study that Recipe can help is uh, studying landslides. Uh, there is a landslide observatory in the uh, United Kingdom called uh, in Holland Hill region in Yorkshire, which has been under uh, different type of uh, monitoring since a decade ago, I think. And uh, people are doing that to kind of predict landslides with the moisture contents and moisture dynamic changes over the years. For instance, uh, in a study conducted in 2015 and uh, through 2016, they realized there is a resistive structure uh, which, which, is, which is topped with a conductive structure and uh, with more geological studies, they saw that this part is mudstone and this is sandstone. And when the moisture content increases inside this muddy area, it usually starts to flow over the sandstone. With a time-lapse analysis during that year, starting from uh, July, they realized the surface, especially around this muddy area, is getting drier and drier. And eventually, that because of some rain and uh, uh, precipitation that happened in the area, the uh, landslide occurred and post measurement, electrical uh, resistivity measurement showed that this area has significantly lower re resistivity compared to previous times, meaning that it actually got more wet. So if they had a uh, higher resolution, temporarily higher resolution measurements, they could have kind of predicted that because if the resistivity is decreasing and it's getting more wet, you can kind of assume, all right, this mudstone is going to slide sometime soon. They also conducted that in a 3D survey. They laid down a grid 
like that over the area of uh, uh, about 100 meters by I think around 30 meters or something. And the, in 2017, and they clearly identified the, the mudstone flow load that the uh, uh, rupture would uh, happen from here and then kind of flow over the sandstone. But uh, over the time in 2017, uh, the difference resistivity inversion showed that actually the whole uh, surface is dry and there is no indication of a, a more wetting area top compared to bottom. So probably landslides possibly is not really uh, a thing anymore, at least not now. So with that, uh, I'd like to, to thank you. We try to make recipe accessible to everyone, especially for those in education, because uh, we know the cost of uh, so commercial software, like res 2 game, for example, is, they are pretty expensive. Uh, we chose it as an open source software because we like your feedback. We like you to contribute. We like everybody to edit the code and may add uh, good features to it. Uh, for example, a few weeks ago, a friend of mine uh, told me that I added a feature that you can convert the local grid to UTM grid. Do you like it? And I said, of course, please give it to us. We will tweak it and make it work with recipe. So in future, you would also be available with uh, uh, with conversion from local grid to UTM grid. And at the end, why not open source? Everybody likes free stuff, right? And uh, with that, please help. Please try to contribute and uh, go visit our repository or watch our YouTube channel. Additionally, you can follow our ResearchGate uh, page. Uh, in that, uh, we are showing you the updates that happen uh, over time, and uh, you can uh, follow the updates. Thank you very much.